All right, well, welcome everyone to the Visual Sonics Live webinar series. My name is Sarah Burris. I'm the scientific liaison here at Fujifilm Visual Sonics. Today, we have a very exciting presentation for you titled Modeling Congenital Heart Disease in Mice Through Ultrasound Guided Microinjections. Just a few notes about our webinar. A recording of the webinar will be made available after today. All of the lines of our participants are muted for the duration of the webinar. So if you have a question, please submit those through the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be answered at the end of this session and you can expect our webinar to be approximately 30 to 35 minutes with another five minutes or so of questions and answers. Our presenter today, Anam Rodman, is an MD PhD student at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Medicine and Department of Medical Biophysics. Anum's research revolves around understanding the relationship between heart and brain development in pediatric populations. In her PhD, she has used mouse models along with ultrasound and magnetic resonance imaging to probe the cardiac neurodevelopment axes. Currently, she's back in medical school and is preparing to defend her PhD. While in graduate school, Anum has published 11 peer-reviewed publications on diverse scientific topics, including placental development, pregnancy disorders, arterial wave mechanics, modeling vascular networks, and cardiac disease. Anum has given numerous talks at local and international conferences, including the International Society for Ultrasound and Obstetrics and Gynecology, the Cardiac Neurodevelopment Outcome Collaborative, and the Organization of Human Brain Mapping. Outside of research, Anum is a member of the Equity Committee for a local community organization in Toronto called the East Scarsboro Storefront and is also a, men excuse me, a mentor for high school students and undergraduate students. She also enjoys playing volleyball and cooking spicy South Asian curries. And with that, I give you a num. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I'm just going to dive right into our talk today. So um, I'm going to be talking about how to model congenital heart disease in mice uh, by using ultrasound guided microinjections. So um, for uh, the audience members who may not be uh, familiar with the term congenital heart disease, um, it's basically uh, an umbrella term, um, which represents um, structural heart defects uh, that develop in utero. So it's something uh, that goes wrong with the cardiac developmental program uh, during uh, pregnancy. So the newborn is often born with <clears throat> like severe defects that can be present in various structures of the heart. And hypoplastic left heart syndrome, or HLHS, is one type of congenital heart disease uh, in which the left heart is severely underdeveloped. So I'm going to specifically focus on HLHS, uh, which uh, was actually the focus of my PhD as well. So um, hypoplastic left heart syndrome has uh, several key features. Uh, including a hypoplastic left ventricle. So if you take a look at this figure over here, you'll see that the left ventricle is um, very small in size and it doesn't fully come down all the way to the cardiac apex as compared to the right ventricle. Furthermore, there's also mitral valve uh, atresia or stenosis. There can also be aortic valve atresia or stenosis and the um, ascending aorta appears to be hypoplastic. So um, what ends up happening is that the combination of these left heart lesions uh, leads to um, impairments in blood flow uh, in the heart. So in the normal fetal circulation, what would normally happen is that the oxygenated blood from the placenta would enter the inferior vena cava. And then from here, the oxygenated blood is preferentially streamed through a physiological shunt called the foramen ovale which connects the right and left atria. And then from here, this oxygenated blood would enter the left atrium, then it goes into the left ventricle, the ascending aorta, from where it goes um, through the uh, vessels into the brain. So the brain is really getting uh, very highly oxygenated blood in normal circulation. In um, HLHS, because the left heart is so small, uh, it actually uh, ends up uh, providing very high resistance to this uh, preferential streaming that should have happened. So instead, what now happens is that the oxygenated blood is diverted away from this foramen ovale and instead is directed into this right atrium, which is larger and provides lower resistance. 
Um, and here, this oxygenated blood mixes with the systemic venous blood that's entering um, the right atrium from the superior and inferior vena cava. And then this mixed blood then enters the right ventricle. And from here, it goes up through the main pulmonary artery into the ductus arteriosus, which is another shunt in the fetus that uh, connects the main pulmonary artery to the um, aortic arch. And then from here, uh, the circuit that the blood takes is essentially it has to travel in this retrograde manner along the aortic arch in order to perfuse the brain. So um, really, uh, in hypoplastic left heart syndrome, we often call this pattern or circulation um, uh, a ductal dependent flow, meaning that um, in this case, uh, perfusion to the brain and um, systemic circulation is dependent on having this ductus arteriosus shunt open. So in the fetus, this shunt is open, which is why uh, most uh, fetuses with HLHS can survive to gestational term. But after birth, what happens is that usually within 48 hours, this shunt will physiologically close. And um, if this happens with an HLHS heart, as you can imagine, uh, that would uh, be um, catastrophic. So without uh, any kind of uh, medical or surgical intervention to keep this shunt open, uh, it can actually lead to um, demise or like death in the newborn. So um, an interesting, uh, I, I think, observation which um, led me to my PhD was that in HLHS and other severe congenital heart diseases, what you observe is that there's a very high prevalence of neural developmental disorders in the newborns who survive. Um, and we find that in HLHS, this can be present in up to 30% of survivors. Um, and the kinds of neurodevelopmental disorders can be quite debilitating. Um, these include cognitive impairment, autism spectrum disorders, delayed motor skills. And usually as you track these individuals through childhood, you find that they're not really meeting their normal developmental milestones as you would expect. Um, interestingly, a lot of studies, uh, especially neuroimaging studies, have documented that um, these neurodevelopmental disorders are preceded by um, fetal brain dismaturation, commonly that's observed on MRI. So what we usually see um, is a phenotype where the gray matter volumes are smaller, the gyri haven't fully developed, um, there's also decreases in the white matter volume. So it really just looks like the fetal brain hasn't really grown as much as it should have. And currently we don't really know why that is, but there have been uh, several hypotheses in the literature uh, that have been uh, documented. Um, one of them, which uh, has um, a lot of evidence at this point is the idea that, um, you know, it's really because of this retrograde blood flow pattern in HLHS, which is leading to uh, mixed blood being delivered to the brain rather than the freshly oxygenated blood we would expect. And that leads to decreased cerebral oxygenation, which then somehow leads to this um, immature brain phenotype. So that's one hypothesis. Um, other possibilities, however, include that really the fetal brain dismaturation phenotype may have not much to do with the heart phenotype, but you know, there is some underlying placental disease, uh, which is why the brain is uh, developing abnormally. And yet another hypothesis is that um, it doesn't really have much to do with the abnormal circulation that's going to the brain, but it has something to do with intrinsic defects. So the, you know, the, the genetic defects such as in the notch one gene, which have been associated with HLHS, um, that could be causing the heart defects, but you know, if uh, mutated in the brain, those genes could also be causing the brain defects. So it's something intrinsic. So um, in my PhD, I was really interested in teasing out this factor. Like I really wanted to know if mixed deli uh, the delivery of mixed blood to the uh, brain alone uh, could result in this uh, immature brain phenotype. So for that, um, I really needed a model where the defect would be um, limited to the heart so that um, I could then attribute any resulting brain abnormalities to purely the effects of the heart and the abnormal circulation. So that's how I kind of, uh, you know, got into this realm of trying to develop a, a model uh, of congenital heart disease in mice. So um, the idea that I had was um, something by 
from which I had observed in the literature, they often talk about this uh, hypothesis or this phenomenon called the low flow, low growth hypothesis so in cardiac development. And the idea here really is that um, during development, if the heart is not really receiving adequate flow, it doesn't really grow. So um, I wanted to see if, um, you know, we could perturb blood flow or decrease blood flow in the left heart and then cause this HLHS phenotype or not. So the idea we had was, um, you know, if we could decrease blood flow in the left atrium from entering into the left ventricle and then the ascending aorta, um, we could then potentially cause hypoplasia of these structures. So that was the um, hypothesis that we had. So um, our next uh, sort of um, problem was, well, how can we perturb blood flow in the mouse fetus? And the idea we had was to combine ultrasound guided microinjections with uh, delivery of an embolizing agent directly into the heart. So um, really I wanted to um, be able to target something very accu accurately into the heart, which is why ultrasound guided microinjections made sense. And I also needed something that I would inject, which would um, you know, be, in well, first of all, be injectable, but it would embolize and solidify sort of rapidly because you can't have a situation in the heart where you inject this agent and then it takes a long time for it to solidify. And then, you know, with the cardiac cycle, it's sort of like fragmenting and going everywhere into the systemic circulation. So um, I decided on using this product called a shear thinning uh, biomaterial. And um, this product has really neat properties, um, which is basically that its um, viscosity is dependent on uh, shear rates. So if you have this product in a syringe and you um, advance your uh, syringe plunger forward, the product experiences high rates of uh, shear and it thins out uh, and it behaves like a liquid. So it actually injects out. But you'll notice that here, while it's being injected in the glass of water, um, once the product has extruded from the needle tip, it ex experiences low rates of shear and it um, solidifies this almost instantly. So um, this was something that I thought, uh, you know, would work really well for my needs. Um, and because uh, it was injectable, um, it, it would sort of work well with uh, ultrasound guided microinjections. So um, I just wanted to show you what my um, setup really was to perform these procedures in fetal mice. Um, so here I'm showing the Visual Sonics uh, injector mount. Um, and over here where you see clamp to secure the Visual Sonics microinjector unit, uh, over here that actually essentially goes in here. And um, you have a bunch of <clears throat> knobs and controls uh, that lets you move the microinjector unit along the X plane, the Z plane, and the Y plane. So you can move it in various different directions that you need. Um, and then one uh, sort of modification that we made uh, was that we kind of created this 3D printed tower where we had a Petri dish filled with PBS. And that was essentially uh, to submerge the needle tip uh, of, from the microinjector unit into the PBS. Um, during times when we were not injecting the embolizing agent into the mouse. Um, and this was necessary because we found that uh, the embolizing agent that we used, if the needle tip is exposed to air for prolonged periods of time, it actually crystallizes and becomes solid and uh, you can't really inject out anymore. So, but if you keep it submerged in PBS, um, the needle tip stays patent and you can keep injecting out. So um, after we figured out our uh, microinjector setup, um, we had to figure out when to actually uh, perform the embolization in mice. And um, we decided to perform uh, it at a time point of embryonic day 14.5 days in CD1 mice. Um, and this is because at 14.5 days, we noticed that the heart has actually um, achieved is confirmation that you would expect to see an adult heart. So you have two atria, you have two ventricles, and they're separated by uh, a septum, and the aorta is pointing to the left, the pulmonary artery is pointing to the right. So it looks like it should. And then after 14.5 days, what happens is the heart is really just growing in size dramatically. So we thought that 14.5 days would be the right time point to do our intervention. And um, we had uh, three groups of mice. So at 14.5 days, the embolized mice were the ones where we're actually doing the embolization procedure and we're injecting approximately 70 nanoliters of the embolizing agent. 
sham was where we advanced the needle into the left atrium, but we don't actually do any embolizations. And then control mice, uh, the pregnancy progresses as normal. Um, and then at gestational term, which is 18.5 days in CD1 mice, um, we wanted to see uh, you know, what, what actually happens. Are we able to produce a phenotype or not? Um, and to test that, we used a two-prong approach. One was using color Doppler ultrasound uh, to determine if HLHS mice actually have that retrograde aortic arch flow pattern, which is a key functional abnormality we see in HLHS. And then with ex vivo MRI, uh, we wanted to quantify the cardiac morphology. So do HLHS mice actually have this very small left ventricle and hypoplastic ascending aorta phenotype? So um, here I'm just going to show you, um, I guess, a cartoon version of what my surgical setup was like. Um, and the imaging was performed on the Visual Sonics Vivo 2100 system using a 40 megahertz ultrasound transducer. So um, essentially, you have your 14.5 day uh, pregnant CD1 mouse, um, and the mouse is laid on a heated platform and it's uh, receiving uh, anesthesia 2.5% isoflurane and 100% O2. And prior to the surgical procedure, you also give the pregnant mouse uh, analgesia. Um, and then what you do is you remove abdominal hair and you perform a small incision into the abdomen that's about two to three centimeters long vertically. Um, and then what you do is you extract out the uterine horn um, and uh, then you basically place this uh, petri dish, which has a little hole in the middle, and you extract the uterine horn uh, through this hole using your forceps. And then uh, what you do is you place the silicone blocker against the uterus or the uterine horn. Um, and this is just to make sure that when you're advancing your needle forward, the entire uterus is not moving with your needle. And then you stabilize everything on these plasticine blocks. Uh, and then you're basically ready to image. Um, so what you do is, um, if you'll notice uh, in this diagram, um, the fetus is actually um, you know, uh, oriented in such a way that you'll be taking a cross section uh, through the fetal body, essentially. So the spine is more or less facing up towards the transducer. And um, what you do is you place sterile ultrasound gel on the uterus and you bring your ultrasound transducer down and then you start to scan uh, up towards the head. Once you do that, um, what you'll notice is an imaging view that looks something like this on your BMO image. Um, and uh, you're looking for your heart. So you'll see the left ventricle beating over here. The fetal spine is over here. The placenta is away from your microinjection needle because you don't want to go through the placenta. And you can also see the silicone blocker. Um, a key thing to note here, though, this is not, uh, you know, the spine is not completely like 90 degrees um, and like facing up towards the transducer. Like if you look in the, I guess, the exit plane in this image, the spine is about 30 degrees counterclockwise a little bit in the imaging plane. Um, and I would usually do that just by using a little cotton swab to turn the fetal orientation a little bit. Um, and that's actually needed to get the left atrium into the imaging plane. And what you're looking for is um, these two bright horizontal lines demarcated by this yellow arrow, which is showing you the top and bottom walls of the left atrium. And you need these to be nice and bright so you know you're actually in the imaging plane or not. So after you figured out your pre-injection orientation, which is key because if this orientation is incorrect, nothing else will really go well. So once this is uh, performed properly, uh, then you're ready to actually do the embolization procedure. So again, uh, what you wanna do is once you're advancing the needle forward and you're getting towards the uterus, you actually want to bring the needle into the imaging plane. So you would actually use the knob that moves the uh, microinjection needle along the Y plane in this diagram. And you wanna keep moving it until you'll see that your needle um, starts off as being less bright and then it'll become maximally bright. And that's the point where you want to stop because your needle is also now in the same imaging plane as your left atrium target. So once you have that, you advance your needle tip uh, in through the uterus into the thoracic cavity and you basically stop 
uh, such that your needle tip is situated centrally in between the bottom and top walls of the left atrium. Uh, and at this point, you would uh, deliver your embolizing agent, which was 70 nanoliters. So you'll see that, um, you know, there is a black sort of like halo that's starting to form around the needle tip, which is the embolizing agent uh, being injected out. After that, you want to confirm whether the embolization was positive or not. Um, and in this image, um, if you take a look between these two sort of horizontal white arrows, you'll see there's this black sort of hypoecogenic black mass that sort of like this blob that's kind of moving left to right with the cardiac cycle. Um, and that basically means that your embolization was positive and is limited to the uh, left atrium. So that's, those are the, some key features that you're looking for. So just to quickly show you my surgical setup. Um, so all the procedures that I performed were done in a sterile manner, including um, all the equipment was sterilized as well. But really um, you want a Petri dish that looks something like this. So you have a hole in the middle and then it's covered by a thin, like a plastic rubber membrane. And then um, within that, you wanna create like this oval shaped hole through which you'll actually advance your forceps through to extract the uterine horn out. And then all the other uh, surgical materials that I used are also uh, shown over here. So um, after you perform the surgical procedure, you um, place the uterus back inside the abdominal cavity suture, uh, and then the pregnant dams recover within like four minutes uh, max. Um, and you want to keep the total surgical time within 30 to 40 minutes, not more than that, because the prolonged anesthesia can have detrimental effects on uh, fetal development and it can cause fetal demise. Um, and then after you're done the surgery, the mouse recovers and um, you let it survive till 18.5 days, at which point you again collect data to see whether the HLHS phenotype is present or not. So I wanted to show you some outcomes at gestational term. So we injected um, 17 sham mice and from that 13 were alive at 18.5 days in this study. And in the embolized group, we injected 45 mice, and from that, 25 were alive uh, at gestational term. And from that, about half had positive left atrium embolization on MRI. So um, this was after this uh, sort of initial study, I learned a lot of lessons as to what not to do and you know how to make sure my fetuses survive and how to make sure that my embolization is actually positive. So I wanted to share some of those tips with you. Um, so one key thing, as I mentioned before, is to really make sure that your needle tip is maximally bright. So, you know, you're in the same imaging plane as your left atrium target. Um, and, you know, if you take a look at this image on the top over here, the ultrasound image, you'll notice that, uh, you know, as you uh, look forward towards the needle tip, you'll notice that the signal intensity of the needle tip sort of drops off and it becomes less bright. And that should be something to notice, which means that you're actually not in the imaging plane anymore. You're either in front of or like behind the left atrium target. Um, so, you know, uh, the target was actually this yellow star over here, and this is the bottom wall of the left atrium. So um, I thought like when I was doing this, that I'm probably in the imaging plane, but I was not. Uh, and when you look on MRI after to see where, where that embolization agent landed, it landed outside of the heart. So this is the left ventricle over here, and you'll see that it's located um, outside of the left ventricle muscle tissue. So somewhere in the pericardial cavity and the left ventricle. Similarly, in this one, the needle tip is nice and bright all the way through. Um, but again, I'm not sort of situated centrally in between the top and bottom walls uh, of the left atrium. Uh, I should, my needle tip should actually be right here, but it's a little bit like behind. And then again, if you look on MRI, um, you notice that the embolizing agent uh, encircled in yellow are actually outside of the heart. Um, so I just wanted to show you uh, our results uh, from our study. So what happened at 18.5 days after we performed this embolizing agent procedure at 14.5 days. So um, to see if the mice had retrograde flow or not, we obtained uh, a three vessel imaging view. Um, and in this one, uh, you're basically looking for three vessels uh, called the ductus arteriosus, the aortic arch, and the superior vena cava in this sort of triangular orientation. Um, and to detect whether they have retrograde flow or not, um, I use color Doppler ultrasound. 
So on color Doppler, red means flow that's going towards the transducer and blue means flow that's going away from the transducer. So if your transducer is on top, uh, you'll see that in control and sham mice, flow in the ductus arteriosus vessel indicated by the black arrow and flow in the aortic arch vessel indicated by the white arrow um, is in the same direction in both vessels. And you see the same thing in the sham mice. And that actually is the normal physiology, as we said before, is what you would expect. Um, and then if you look at the embolized mice, you'll see that flow in the ductus uh, arteriosus is going towards the transducer, but in the aortic arch is going away from the transducer. So it's going in a retrograde manner, opposite in the direction of the ductus arteriosus flow. Um, and we found that in all our mice that have the left atrium positive uh, embolization, every single one of them had this retrograde aortic arch flow pattern, which was super exciting. So um, then we wanted to quantify the left ventricle hypoplasia. And um, we did this with uh, MRI. So what you're actually looking at right now are 3D renderings from segmenting different changes of the heart on 3D MRI data sets. Um, so this was the imaging itself was a T2 weighted scan and um, the resolution was 40 micron isotropic. So we needed um, sort of very high resolution to quantify any volumetric changes that may be um, evident. So um, if you take a look at this figure over here, you'll notice that the right ventricle in white and the left ventricle in red are about the same size and in both the control and the sham mice and the left ventricle sort of comes down to make the cardiac apex, which is sort of this triangular spot in the heart. Um, if you compare that to the embolized mice, you'll notice a very dramatic difference and it's very obvious uh, on MRI when you see it. Um, and it's basically that the right ventricle is gigantic and it comes all the way down to make the cardiac apex. So it kind of overtakes the left ventricle, which is um, instead very, very small. Uh, it doesn't fully reach the cardiac apex and it has very like thin morphology. So it's very thin looking. Um, the embolizing agent uh, is actually this uh, purple blob that's sitting inside the left atrium cavity. You can also appreciate in this uh, figure that the um, ascending aorta, which is this pink color over here, is a lot smaller in caliber as compared to the pulmonary artery, which is um, yellow in color. So we also wanted to quantify this a little bit more formally. Um, so I have the quantitative values for you here. Um, but essentially, um, it reflects what we saw in the previous figure, which is that in the embolized group, the ascending aorta volumes are dramatically smaller it, as compared to the sham and control mice on the order of 70 to 75 percent smaller. Conversely, the main pulmonary artery volumes are significantly larger in the embolized mice as compared to the sham and control mice. Um, which is something that we expect to see. So what we're expecting to see is that the left ventricle and the ascending aorta are hypoplastic. They're not really growing, they're very small, but the right side of the heart and the my main pulmonary artery are very large. Um, one key thing to note is that I did notice, uh, even though I had picked this product because um, at, uh, when it was previously used in another paper, they had actually injected it in the femoral artery of adult mice. Um, and they had shown that it doesn't really fragment. Um, I used it in a slightly different application where I'm injecting it into a heart in fetal mice. Um, and I actually did observe that there was some fragmentation that happened in about half my mice. Um, so for instance, in this one, the fragment has, uh, so the embolizing agent has actually fragmented away from the left atrium, is broken off and has gotten stuck in the ascending aorta over here. Um, similarly, in this image in the middle, it's uh, gotten stuck in the aortic arch vessel. So really, we found that if the embolizing agent breaks, it tends to get stuck at branching junctions. So the significance of this really is that this is the first cardiac-specific mouse model of HLHS that actually survives to gestational term and reproduces all the hemodynamic and structural abnormalities that is observed, um, which really is, I think, quite important because at the moment, there really aren't any models that are able to do this. So you know, at the moment, we don't really understand, uh, for instance, why there are, um, uh, why, why the left ventricle becomes hypoplastic in HLHS. And one of the problems really is that because models don't really survive, you can't really study that process. And it, that question really has been intractable. So um, I think with the development of this model, we'll be able to answer um, that question and also be able to understand whether there's any impact of this abnormal circulation on brain development or placental development. 
Um, this, uh, the work that I presented here was recently uh, published uh, as a resource article. Um, so if you like, you can read uh, more about it in detail. Um, I wanted to uh, end this talk with uh, some other applications of ultrasound guided microinjections that our lab has undertaken, which I think, uh, you know, is exciting and could be of interest to others as well. Um, so uh, for this portion, I wanted to give a shout out to my fellow colleague, Sarah Debaba at the Mouse Imaging Center, who is a PhD candidate in our lab. Uh, so Sarah is interested in understanding the relationship between uh, maternal placental disease and fetal growth restriction. Um, and she's actually using ultrasound guided microinjections and embolizations of uh, maternal vasculature in the placenta uh, to see if that can uh, cause fetal growth restriction uh, in which really the fetus uh, fails to reach its predetermined growth potential. So um, on the left over here, I have uh, a microcomputer tomography image of the mouse placenta and the maternal blood essentially, uh, you know, enters a uterine artery, goes down these radial arteries through the spiral arteries, and then into these, uh, these large compliant uh, vessels uh, called the maternal canals, from which they, um, then the blood goes into this exchange region where you basically have uh, fetal vessels from the placenta. They're sort of like floating around in that maternal blood and they're uptaking the nutrients and the oxygen that's coming in from the maternal circulation. So Sarah wanted to see if, you know, we could embolize these maternal canals. Um, would that, you know, first instance cause secondary damage to those fetal placental vessels and then potentially also cause growth restriction or not? So in terms of the ultrasound or B-mode image version of this micro CD image, uh, just to orient you, the purple area represents over here on B-mode, the spiral arteries, uh, this red arrow is representing the maternal canal that's going through the placenta, and this actually is the fetus itself. So um, here is Sarah scanning the mouse placenta, I believe at 15.5 days gestation. And um, what you'll see is that as she scans, there is this imaging window during which the um, top and bottom walls of the vessels becomes nice and bright. Uh, and that's what you wanna see. You wanna embolize um, in that imaging plane. So once she finds her target and the vessel is nice and aligned in the imaging plane, uh, she advances her needle into the vessel. And you'll notice that once she embolizes, like right there, the um, vessel walls expand and you'll notice immediately that the flow stops. Uh, so in it before you can see like there's a speckle pattern going, uh, moving through the um, vasculature, like through the maternal canal showing that there is flow. And then after she inject, injects that seizes and it stops. And then after she, uh, she advances the needle out, you'll notice that uh, the vessel is nice and expanded, the canal is nice and expanded, and there's no flow um, going through it. So similarly, um, after that, you know, you suture the uh, mouse and then it recovers, and then you try to see at 18.5 uh, days or at term, you know, what were the outcomes uh, in terms of fetal growth restriction patterns. So um, Sarah has been working on this and, um, uh, we'll see uh, what kind of results she gets, but it's uh, something that's very exciting at the moment. I think lastly, I wanted to talk about uh, one other application which I was thinking about, which is um, you could potentially use ultrasound guided microinjections to create models of uh, ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke in mice. Um, and the reason I said this was um, I noticed that in my mice where you actually had this behavior where the embolizing agent fragmented and it got uh, you know, stuck in the carotid arteries, for instance, um, they had evidence on MRI of um, ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke. So if you take a look over here in this fetus, um, you'll notice that there is some uh, bleeding that has happened in the deep, uh, deeper like subcortical region. Um, and then you also sort of see this like mass effect and edema that's happening uh, in the um, lateral ventricle. So this area is completely enlarged um, and you can compare it to the normal cortex, which is what it should look like on this side. So I thought this was something interesting. Um, and you know, uh, 
in an inadvertent side effect, I guess you could say that I observed in my model, but I think if you could do targeted injections into the carotids or even in the cerebral vessels, you could have a novel model of fetal stroke. Um, you could also potentially apply this method in uh, neonatal or adult mice. Uh, I think, uh, I don't know too much about it, but I think um, currently uh, models of stroke usually involve um, exposing the carotids, I think through a surgical procedure and they'll either ligate it or like cauterize the carotid vessels. And then you place the mouse in a hypoxia chamber to produce that, which I think is quite invasive. So I think, uh, you know, performing ultrasound guided microinjections and embolizing vessels in a more targeted manner could um, help improve um, uh, th those methods and improve the phenotypes perhaps that we observe. Um, so lastly, the advantages of current method are that we can model cardiac diseases and placental diseases in isolation, and then we could see how, uh, you know, for instance, these diseases can combine together to affect the fetus. Uh, one key thing is that I think um, performing ultrasound guided microinjection, it gives you a lot of control over the not just the site of where you're injecting, but also timing. So you can perturb blood flow either early in gestation or late in gestation, and you can really vary the disease severity and understand sort of the impact on development based on when you're actually performing your interventions. Um, the other thing is you can also combine the mouse model uh, with your gene of interest uh, with blood flow perturbation that you produce to sort of understand the relationship between genetics and blood flow disturbance interactions. Uh, and then you can also perform vascular embolizations to perhaps create models of stroke. Um, I would like to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. John Sled, uh, for providing uh, a lot of advice and help throughout my PhD, um, and all my colleagues at the Mouse Imaging Center and the Hospital for Sick Children, who have also provided a lot of valuable advice, and uh, Fred Roberts from Visual Sonics Toronto, who was very helpful in helping me get started with the imaging and the microinjection setup uh, during the very early days of this project. Um, and yeah, that's the end of my talk, and I'm happy to take any questions. Excellent talk, and um, really, really interesting. Uh, we do have some questions that have filtered in. Just a reminder to our audience, if you do have questions for our presenter, please submit those through the Q&A, not the chat. So Anam, first question, are there neurodevelopment disorders associated with other CHD which deliver low oxygenated blood to brain? Yeah, there actually are. Um, so for instance, um, one of them is transposition of the great arteries, which is another very um, severe type of congenital heart disease. Um, and in this, what actually happens is that the, um, as the name suggests, so the aorta is transposed uh, onto the right side. So instead of coming out from the left ventricle, the aorta comes out from the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery comes out from the left ventricle. So what ends up happening in this pattern of circulation is that the deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle goes through the aorta and then like to the brain. Um, so that's one of them. There's also double outlet right ventricle uh, where the right ventricle has both the aorta and the main pulmonary artery coming out from the same right ventricle. Um, and there's also tetralogy of Fallot. So there's other different kinds of congenital heart diseases that are also associated with similar patterns of this very immature brain that's, that looks like it's just like stopped growing or hasn't really grown as much as it should have. Great, thank you. Um, is there a way that you can improve the rates of distal fragmentation and fetal, fetal survival um, observed with your current method? Yeah, so um, I think in terms of distal fragmentation, um, I think one thing that could be do, is, what, what I could do potentially in the future is to control the fetal heart rate during my experiments. Um, so one thing uh, which I didn't mention is um, I actually, when I applied the ultrasound gel onto the uterus, it's very cold ultrasound gel. And my idea was that that would help to reduce the heart rate a little bit so I could you know, perform this uh, embolizing procedure um, and lower the risk of fragmentation. Um, there are other approaches though, for instance, um, if you could temporarily um, increase the anesthetic co concentration, that could decrease the heart rate enough that you would, you know, maybe wait a minute until the embolizing agent has sort of fully stabilized and then you could decrease the anesthesia concentration again. Uh, that's one approach. You could also potentially inject adenosine into the heart. So there are other ways you could improve the distal fragmentation behavior. Um, and then in terms of fetal survival, 
Um, one thing I really uh, noticed was that um, when you're advancing your microinjection needle through the uterus, uh, you'll also notice that there are vitiline vessels um, along sort of the amniotic sac that you observe uh, running down. Uh, and you really want to avoid poking that because that can actually cause fetal demise, um, especially after 14.5 days gestation. Uh, so that is something to avoid. Um, and then one other thing is when you're advancing your needle uh, towards the left atrium target, sometimes I found that, you know, my needle was like a little bit too high or a little bit too low. And then, you know, I would try to like angle the needle while I'm inside like the thoracic cavity. Like that's also a bad idea not to do that. That can cause a lot of like hemorrhaging. Really, if that ends up happening, what you want to do is like you want to extract your needle out all the way through the uterus. Um, you know, raise it or lower it however much you need to, and then like try again. So those were some things that I think were important. Great, thank you. Um, another question, can we do this in an adult mouse as an alternative to the left anterior descending artery ligation? Oh, um, that's a good question. Like in terms of like potentially modeling like myocardial ischemia or something, um, I have never really thought about that, um, but um, I don't see why not. I mean, I think one, again, the key limitation would be how well are you able to visualize the coronary artery in an adult mouse um, with, for instance, ultrasound and sort of how much like motion there is. Um, but I feel like, yes, like if you could visualize that properly, um, and you could sort of reduce the movement a little bit, like maybe decrease the heart rate a little bit during the procedure. Um, I don't see why not. Like you could definitely perform uh, ultrasound guided injections with this agent and like block, block that vessel. Yeah. Great, hey, thank you. Um, can you comment as to why you chose 14 and a half uh, days for the gestational age to perform the cardiac micro injections? Yeah, so um, we picked 14.5 days because um, really, uh, if you look at the HLHS phenotype, what it looks like is the morphology of the heart looks like the adult heart. The only thing that's wrong is basically that the left heart has stopped growing for some reason. So we wanted to pick a time point where um, in gestation, the heart looks like the adult heart. And it's sort of, you know, gone through um, a bunch of changes that happens such as um, there's a lot of like looping and then there's like septation events at separate chambers of the heart. So we wanted to avoid that embryonic time point where the heart is like folding and developing. A lot of these key things are happening. And we wanted to inject it at a time point when the only thing left for the heart to do is like really grow uh, because our phenotype is like poor growth. So that's why we picked 14.5 days essentially. Great, thank you. And can you comment as to what some of the brain changes are that you have observed in your congenital heart disease model? Yeah, so um, some things that um, I didn't show here, but like um, we observe, for instance, that the um, volumes in the intermediate zone and the ventricular zone, so these are transient areas in the brain when, where there's like neural progenitor cells that are going to give rise to the cortex and um, other structures in the brain. We find that those areas of the brain have very low volumes um, and it occurs on both sides of the brain. So you see these bilateral changes in the cortex, um, which I think is uh, super interesting because it could mean that, um, you know, because these areas which are responsible for growth of the cerebral cortex, if they aren't really developing properly, it may be one reason why we sort of see this immature cortical brain development phenotype in CHD. Great, thank you. Well, I don't see any other questions that have come in through the chat. If you do think of a question for our presenter, by all means, please send that to us at Visual Sonics and we'll be happy to forward that over to our presenter. So with that, I'd like to thank you so much, Anam, for your fantastic presentation today and your time, really interesting work. And uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing some great things from you in the future as well. And just a reminder to our audience, thank you for, to you as well for attending today. And if you'd like to reach out to us, there are numerous channels that you can do so. Uh, you can contact us, of course, through our website, but also through our social media channels, such as LinkedIn and um, Twitter. Thank you, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you again in the future.